it's my great honor and pleasure to give a talk uh, at, at this wonderful workshop uh, in this prestigious place. Um, today I'm going to uh, talk about um, the work conducted uh, in our lab on artificial intelligence. So the title of my talk is Building Better Connected World with Artificial Intelligence Technologies. So my talk will consist of two parts. First, I will just pick up some examples of the work uh, done at our lab uh, on AI uh, for the business of our company and also for the people uh, in the world. And then I will just uh, focus on one area uh, that is deep learning for natural language processing, uh, uh, which I'm also uh, working on. Um, so my talk is more practical uh, than theoretical. So <laughs> I don't want to talk to so, so much about math before mathematicians. Um, uh, but I like math. Um, but at the end of my talk, I will call for collaborations uh, from math uh, or theoretical people uh, because uh, we think that uh, deep learning has brought new challenges to machine learning theory. And we really need uh, some uh, breakthrough uh, in theory uh, on deep learning, uh, in general machine learning. So um, this is the vision of our company. So we want to build a better connected world uh, with ICT technologies. So for our lab, it means uh, artificial intelligence technologies. Um, so our lab, lab has a very unique name. It's called Noir's Art Lab uh, because the founder of the company, uh, Mr. Ren, uh, he thought that uh, the future of ICT will depend on data, uh, not just algorithms or chips, etc. Um, so because he has this kind of vision five years ago and he saw that the flood of information will come. So Huawei needs to be prepared. <coughs> That's why we need to build our own North Arc and to have our own uh, technologies to serve better the customers. So we have uh, this lab started uh, five years ago. Um, so we have people now uh, 150 researchers, engineers, are uh, working all over the world in uh, roughly 10 cities, including Paris. And as Moan mentioned, we have also people working in the French R&D Center together with other uh, researchers, engineers. Um, so we have eight research areas, uh, which are strongly related to the uh, current products of Huawei and also future products of Huawei. Uh, so they are intelligent telecommunication networks, speech and language, recommendation search, big data and analytics, computer vision, intelligent uh, devices, Internet of Things, and smart city. So as you know that Huawei has uh, three major uh, business areas, telecommunication, consumer, and enterprise. So all our research areas uh, are strongly related to the uh, business of Huawei. Um, so next, I'm going to show you some examples of research uh, on AI uh, related to the products uh, of Huawei. So first, intelligent telecommunication networks. So in this area, we are mainly working on two major problems. One is software-defined networks. The other, network maintenance. We want to use uh, machine learning, data mining technologies to help improve the uh, efficiency uh, etc. of uh, telecommunication networks. So let's look at the example of software-defined networks. So I, I think you might be uh, familiar with this concept. Uh, in the future, we envision that all the networks will be software-defined. And uh, so in this kind of uh, situation, machine learning, data mining can play a very big role because uh, a lot of uh, complicated uh, phenomena cannot be easily defined by human knowledge, right, or uh, by human experts. So it's necessary to take the uh, data-driven machine learning approach uh, to solve all the problems, including, for example, routing in a network or uh, re resource uh, management uh, in a network. So, so in our lab, we have uh, tried to uh, try to uh, develop some technologies. Uh, for SDN uh, using machine learning. For example, in a data center, we have developed technologies to pre predict 
uh, flow, uh, size of flow, etc., uh, in the data center. For example, uh, in a data center, because um, many different users may use uh, the servers, the resources in the data center uh, in a dynamic way. So, so the flow uh, in the data center can dynamically change. So how to predict the flow, the, the size, etc., of the, in the data center uh, cast a uh, big challenge. For example, we have developed um, online algorithms using Gaussian process to predict uh, the flow size. Uh, we have also uh, developed technologies, for example, based on uh, reinforcement learning to do a dynamic routing based on the situation of the uh, data center uh, of the network. We can um, automatically decide uh, the best uh, routing strategy and, and try to uh, minimize um, the uh, completion time. So, so let me show you a video yeah, to demonstrate uh, the work we have done for routing uh, in a data center. So for example, so in a data center, we have a number of large number of servers and a number of routers. So um, by using uh, reinforcement learning, for example, we can uh, decrease uh, task completion time by about 30%. Yeah, you, you see, when we, just a minute, when we iterate uh, using reinforcement learning, we can dynamically uh, Change the policy of the uh, learn the policy of the uh, flow control, and then to to help improve the efficiency of uh, task completion time uh, in this uh, data center. And uh, so, based on simulation, we can improve uh, efficiency by about thirty uh, percent. Uh, let me show you another example. Um, that's the speech and language. We are working on speech recognition, machine translation, and natural language dialogue uh, in this area. Uh, we have developed uh, a number of methods uh, for speech and uh, language uh, dialogue uh, using deep learning. So um, let me uh, also show you a video about uh, single turn dialogue. So in this setting, um, so suppose the user uh, inputs an uh, utterance, then the system uh, returns a response. Uh, here, suppose we have a large amount of uh, data. So, so uh, then the system can uh, automatically generate a response given the utterance, given utterance from the user. Right? This is a generative approach which means the system can automatically uh, create uh, a response. Uh, but the model is changed from a large amount of uh, data. Let me show you a de uh, demo. Oops, sorry. So this is in Chinese. Um, so if you input I want to buy a Samsung phone. Then the system returns. Let us support our national brand. I will explain the detail later. How about Huawei phones? Everybody says it's good. <laughs> this is a joke. I, I will explain the detail later. Suppose you go to a website and you uh, copy and paste any random sentence. You input into the system. This is the original yeah, input. And then the system returns a reply like this automatically. It creates a generate a res reply. For example, another sentence. And again, you get a reply from the 
uh, system. Okay. So, um, so we are the team uh, first develop this model uh, in the area. And uh, so if you are familiar with uh, deep learning, this is a sequence-to-sequence -sequence learning model. So um, basically it's a kind of extension of recurrent neural network. So first, when you give a sentence, uh, we have an encoder uh, based on RNN, recurrent neural network. We transform this uh, sequence of words uh, into a sequence of uh, inter uh, intermediate representations. Okay, and then there we have uh, another uh, RN recurrent neural net network uh, working as a decoder. So the decoders uh, uh, transform the internal uh, representations into a new uh, sequence of words. Because we have um, crowd roughly 4 million um, pairs of sentences uh, from Chinese Weibo which is a kind of Twitter uh, in China. And uh, so, so you, you can take each pair of sentences as one round of uh, conversational data. So the, the original message uh, in Weibo can be viewed as an input from the user. And uh, in Weibo, usually for each post, there are multiple comments from other people. We can take each post, uh, each comment of the uh, post, uh, as a re uh, reply uh, to, to the original uh, input, right? So in this way, we have four million pairs of uh, sentences, um, roughly four million pairs of uh, conversational data. And then we can uh, use the learning, uh, sequence to sequence learning technique to train this model, which has uh, about uh, roughly 100 million parameters uh, in the whole model. Uh, and uh, so one interesting thing is that the model can memorize uh, training data uh, very, very well. So suppose you have a pair, you want the system to memorize, you can just put uh, the training instance, instance uh, into the training data and then to let the uh, system, the model, uh, repeat the training instance. That's why for the second example, it's a, it's a joke. We, we just manually create such a pair and uh, input into the uh, model in the training data and then the, the model can, can memorize it. And once you input the exact the same input, you can get exactly the same response as in the training instance. Okay, that's why we have the Huawei example. And uh, so one interesting thing is that the model can not only memorize uh, training instances, it can also generalize. It can create uh, natural responses uh, given uh, inputs uh, in Chinese. That's very interesting and surprising. So uh, with 100 million parameters, with this kind of you know, uh, complicated model, it can mimic pe people to you know, create natural language sentences. That's very interesting. Um, so we did some um, analysis of results. Roughly 95% uh, of the responses are natural language sentences. That, that means from human's viewpoint, 95% uh, of the uh, replies from the system can be viewed as Chinese sentences. And uh, roughly 76% of, of the replies can form a natural uh, dialogue, one round of uh, natural dialogue. That's also very interesting. And you, you can, you can you know, uh, wheel the reply from the system just like the examples we have seen, right? So the system can intelligently uh, you know, reply to you uh, in natural language. Uh, that's one uh, work we did. Uh, so another big area for us is recommendation and search. We are working with uh, Huawei smartphone uh, group uh, to build uh, search engine, recommendation engine, and uh, information management engine uh, for our smartphone users. For example, this is for the uh, App Store. In China, Huawei does have its own App Store. So we are developing the uh, recommendation search engines uh, with the uh, Huawei smartphone uh, group. So i just give you a rough idea about uh, what I mean by uh, recommendation, search, and app store. So, 
So if you uh, have a Huawei phone, if you don't, please buy one. And if you go to China, you can uh, go to the App Store and there. Um, so if you search uh, for apps or you browse any page, uh, you can get recommendation from us. So the engines behind the App Store are developed by our lab. OK. Um, so next, I'm going to introduce uh, another work by us about uh, personal information management. So uh, many users, almost every user, uh, has a lot of photos uh, on her smartphone, right? And uh, how, how to help the user to find photos, pictures taken on the, uh, st stored on the uh, smartphone is becoming a very uh, big uh, problem. So we again uh, use deep learning technologies to develop a uh, model to help the uh, users to find photos on smartphones. So uh, let me again show you a, v a video. So this is again uh, Chinese. The user can input uh, a Chinese sentence to find uh, photos, images. For example, um, in this case, uh, let me see. Uh, outside from an airplane. Yeah. So, yeah, we have uh, fifty thousand photos uh, in the archive. And uh, as training data, uh, among all the uh, photos, we have uh, created a training data set. For each photo, we have asked people to label uh, each photo with some uh, natural language descriptions. For example, in this case, uh, climb mountain or something. Yeah, you can get related photos. Um, so. Um, the model is very simple. So we have, for example, 20,000 photos uh, labeled. Each photo has uh, roughly five uh, descriptions on average. And then we c build a model like this. We have two CNNs, convolution and neural, neural network. So the uh, CNN on the left-hand side can uh, create one representation given of a photo. And the uh, CNN, Convolution Neural Network, on the right-hand side can create a representation uh, for the natural language sentence, for the text. And then, so we can do a matching between the uh, image representation and the text representation and to see whether um, they, they can match. So given any pair of text and image, we can use this model to decide whether they can match each other very well, uh, semantically, whether they are related or relevant. So we, we have uh, data, as I mentioned, to train this model, uh, to, to learn the representations of image and language, and also uh, learn the mapping relations uh, between the two. So, so with this, we can do a very good job uh, in image retrieval. Uh, another area which like, I would like to uh, quickly introduce is big data analytics. We are working with, for example, uh, telco companies. So at, uh, usually a telco company, uh, they have a lot of data at the te uh, telecommunication network side. Usually it is called uh, operation support system data, so OSS data. Also they have data about customers. Uh, usually it's called business support system data. Um, so we are working with a number of career companies uh, to help them to leverage OSS and BSD data to improve, for example, customer relationship management and management of better management of their uh, telecommunication networks. Uh, for example, one thing we, we, we have been doing is to uh, help telco companies to uh, identify the locations of users. So, for example, if uh, you have a smartphone, your phone uh, usually is keeping talking with the uh, base stations uh, in the surrounding area, right? Every time, uh, every uh, eight seconds, in fact, the phone has one communication with the 
uh, base stations uh, nearby. And then this kind of data is recorded at the base stations. And uh, we can leverage the data to identify the location of each individual user. Yeah, that's the idea here. So we can, in fact, create a trajectory of each individual user based on the uh, data. And this will help the uh, telco companies to uh, improve a lot of things. One thing is, for example, we can help to do a better planning or, uh, for, for a city. Uh, yeah, so this is, for example, um, in the case of Shanghai, uh, China. So we, we are working with one career company to help collect the uh, data of their 5 million uh, users. In this way, we can look, easily look at the uh, population, yeah, how the 5 million users move around uh, in the city, for example. The red arrow indicates that there are more people, more users of this career company at this time uh, window. Okay, and for each, for each user, um, for each user, uh, we have a number of labels. So we can also look at the distribution, distribution of gender, distribution of ages, etc., uh, for a particular time in a particular region uh, among the five. Uh, meeting uh, users. And in this way, we can help the uh, city government to do a better planning, to help uh, the telco company uh, to do a better promotion, etc. So one big challenge here we are facing is, in fact, the uh, data is usually called MR data, uh, measurement report data. So the log data from the base stations uh, it's very noisy. If, if, in, if, if in fact you want to uh, identify the location of a particular user, uh, it's quite noisy. And uh, so, so this uh, figure shows that, um, for example, the uh, line in white is the trajectory of one particular user uh, in several blocks uh, in, in the city. And the red lines are the original data from the uh, base stations, the, the, the MR uh, data, measurement report data. You can see it's very random and very noisy, right? With the original MR data, it's really hard to identify the real trajectory, the locations of uh, the user uh, during different time. So um, it's very necessary to uh, improve the accuracy of trajectory prediction. Uh, from the MR data. That's something we are uh, doing here. Uh, so the, if you take the mean of the data from MR, the, the accuracy is, the, the, the mean is something like 100 meter. It's mu much worse than the GPS prediction. So, so if you only want to use MR data to do a better uh, location prediction, uh, it, it, the MR data is not very useful compared to GPS. So here, what we want to try to do is to just to use MR data to see wh how much we can improve. Yeah, so we have developed a number of models um, to improve the accuracy of uh, location identification of users. For example, the original data is in white. Uh, the, the, uh, tr the ground truth is in white, and then with with one prediction model, we can uh, do a much better job. Uh, the, the, the green one is the output from our model, and we can do a much uh, better job uh, in uh, prediction of user's tra trajectory. Yeah. With additional knowledge uh, from the city, with map knowledge, uh, we can further improve uh, accuracy of um, prediction. <coughs> okay, this is another example. So there are many examples of, of uh, technologies uh, on AI which are, we are developing or we have developed to help uh, improve the uh, productivity, user experiences, etc. So uh, next I'm going to talk more about uh, deep learning for uh, natural language processing. So, and I will particularly point out the 
uh, advantages and the challenges. So uh, you have seen some examples like image retrieval and the natural language dialogue uh, in the first part of my talk. And uh, you also see the power and also uh, some limitations of natural language uh, processing uh, enhanced by deep learning. So um, to me, uh, there are five uh, fundamental uh, problems in natural language processing. If you take a mathematic view on natural langu language processing, uh, the ultimate goal for natural language processing is to let the computers to understand human language, right? But still, it's difficult uh, in, in some sense nearly impossible at this moment, right? We have to st uh, formalize uh, all the major natural language processing problems uh, as mathematical problems. So in my view, there are five fundamental problems uh, in natural language processing uh, from the viewpoint of uh, math. Yeah, so classification, matching, translation, structure prediction, and a Markov decision process. Um, so let, let's la look at all of them one by one. So first, classification. So this problem is like this. Given a string, you want to assign a label to a string. It's very uh, typical or uh, classification problem. So in natural language, I will give you an exa uh, example. So a string uh, can be a sentence or a document. Uh, a label can be a category representing uh, some, for example, um, semantic category, etc. Uh, matching is a problem like this. So given two strings, you want to match uh, the two and to see uh, whether they are relevant or related, etc. And f for translation, you want to transform uh, one st string to another string. And uh, this is also a very important uh, natural language uh, problem. For structure prediction, so given a string, you want to find the structure uh, in the string. And uh, for Markov decision process, uh, in this case, the task is more complicated. And uh, uh, given a state and action, you want to uh, predict what would be the likely uh, state next. Um, so, so if you look at all the major natural language problems uh, in applications, uh, they can be formalized uh, into one of the five uh, basic problems I just uh, have listed up here. For example, text classification, sentiment analysis can be viewed as a classification problem. And matching uh, is widely used in search. So for example, and the question answering. For example, in search, given a query, you want to find the most relevant document, right? It's a, usually a matching problem between the query and uh, a set of uh, document candidates. And this is also so true for dialogue. Some dialogue systems are built on uh, retrieval technologies. So, so in this case, it's also ma matching is also important here. And for translation, we have machine translation, speech recognition, hand writing recognition, and also uh, dialogue, single turn dialogue. So the example I have just shown, generative approach to natural lang language dialogue can be viewed as a kind of translation problem. We, in fact, use sequence to sequence learning techniques to perform uh, the single turn dialogue here, right? It's, uh, again, uh, a translation problem. <laughs> And for st structured prediction, we have, for example, name identity recognition, part of speech tagging, or uh, segmentation, word segmentation in Chinese, uh, sentence parsing, semantic parsing, etc., uh, as e typical examples, right? And for Markov decision process, this can be used in, for example, task dependent multi turn dialogue. If you look at all the major uh, natural language problem, problems uh, in practice, they, they, they can be uh, uh, categorized into uh, the five uh, basic problems. And uh, so recently, we see that uh, for all the five problems, deep learning have, uh, has uh, significantly improved the, the performances uh, for all the four uh, problems in natural language processing, particularly for translation and the structure prediction uh, and matching. Uh, for example, for machine translation, uh, with sequence to sequence learning, uh, the so-called neural machine translation uh, has already outperformed traditional statistical machine translation. And uh, 
So, so uh, this is also true for other tasks. With more data available, uh, we can do a better job with deep learning for all the four uh, problems uh, in natural language processing, except the last one. So, uh, so next I'm going to uh, discuss more about the advantages and uh, limitations of deep learning for uh, natural language processing. So first, let's look at the advantages and uh, uh, disadvantages of deep learning uh, in, in general. Uh, some are maybe more related to natural language processing. For example, uh, we all know that deep learning or deep neural networks uh, is good at uh, pattern recognition, right? So if you like uh, to do something, uh, th there are many complicated patterns used uh, in, the, in the task. Deep learning can easily learn and capture the patterns. For example, even for a machine translation problem, it's in fact a kind of very complicated uh, pattern problem, right? So the deep neural networks uh, have su some kind of capability to uh, acquire the patterns uh, in the problems and then do a very good job. And it's data driven, the performance is high, is higher than the other approaches. And uh, so another advantage is end-to-end uh, -end training. I will further explain this uh, a, a little bit uh, more uh, later. And uh, so you, you don't need to uh, have uh, hu human knowledge uh, involved in system construction. In other words, uh, you don't need to uh, do uh, feature engineering, right? For example, if you work on machine translation, you, you even don't need, need to know the uh, languages, right? You, you, you don't need to have knowledge about the language pair uh, you, you are working on. You only take the data and then feed, feed the data into the uh, system, then you can build a translation system. That was not possible before. Yeah, so end-to-end -end training. And the representation learning. So as we have seen in the image retrieval example, um, deep learning is also very powerful in uh, building uh, re representations uh, across different uh, modalities. Uh, in this way, we can easily do matching uh, between data in different modalities. And uh, also, uh, it's very, in some sense, very easy to build a <coughs> deep neural network system because what you need is just uh, employ the uh, gradient-based uh, method. The, the algorithm is very simple in some sense, right? And uh, so it's quite powerful. But there are also limitations for deep learning. Uh, for example, it's not very good at inference and decision uh, problems. I will uh, give an example later. And, uh, and it's data hungry. You need a lot of data to train the uh, model. And also, it's difficult to uh, handle uh, long tail. I will further explain this long tail problem <coughs> later. And uh, the model is usually uh, a black box. Uh, it's difficult to understand, interpret uh, the mechanism inside the system. And uh, the computational cost of training is very high. And also, for some unsupervised learning problems, it's still not clear whether we can uh, develop a very powerful deep learning uh, method to address uh, the problems. And uh, so the fun fundamental issue with deep learning is the last one. It still lacks of theoretical foundation. That's something I want to emphasize at this workshop. I will talk more uh, uh, later. So let's look at several uh, advantages and disadvantages. First, end-to-end -end, uh, training. As we have seen in the uh, natural language dialogue example, it's really surprising, right? The system, the model uh, can be built with a lot of data without any human involvement. It's just a kind of sequence to sequence learning. Two uh, RNs, one encoder, one decoder, and uh, they can just transform the representations from one sentence to another sentence. And uh, this is really surprising. And this can be observed uh, in many different tasks in natural language and even in other fields. You don't need to understand the uh, details of this pro particular problem. For example, if it's translation, you even don't to need to understand the two languages. And, uh, but yeah, so, so in, in the meantime, it also means that this is a huge black box. We really don't know what is happening inside. And uh, another uh, advantage for deep learning is representation learning. Before, in natural language processing, when you do information retrieval, for example, uh, question answering search, 
uh, you also do matching, but you represent, um, for example, uh, two strings, query and document, uh, with vectors based on uh, terms, based on uh, symbols, right? And uh, it's a kind of symbolic matching. But this is only possible uh, for comparing two strings. That means you, you can only do symbol matching uh, between strings. It's not, it was not possible or uh, even thought possible before for matching across different modalities. For example, if you want to do query and uh, image matching, or query is in natural language, text to image matching, it was not possible. Yeah, people yeah, didn't realize that it was possible. But with deep learning, we can in fact uh, learn representations uh, for image and text and perform matching between image and text. And they, uh, they work very well. Yeah, th that's something really surprising. Yeah, so, so that, to me, those are the two surprises. Uh, one is end-to-end -end training. Another is cross-modality uh, training. Yeah, so this is very, you know, a kind of mysterious or magic. And uh, it was, they were not possible before. Yeah. And then let's look at the uh, limitations. First, inference and decision. So there are many uh, hard problems in natural language, particularly the multi-turn dialogue. Uh, let's just look at an example. Yeah, multi-turn uh, question answering. Uh, still, it, it would be difficult. It would be difficult for deep learning to address multi-turn question answering. For example, single turn is very easy. Uh, for example, if you ask how tall is Yao Ming, uh, he is a very popular basketball player in China, and uh, then the system may return an answer, right, automatically. So the single turn question answering system can be based on deep learning, and it can be based on retrieval based or uh, generation based. That, that is fine, right? So uh, and I, as I have explained, deep learning can do a very good job uh, in such kind of problems, matching and the translation. And, uh, but if you go to uh, multi-turn question answering, it becomes much more challenging and complicated. For example, we have two rounds of uh, conversation. The first round is the same, but if you have another round of conversation, the user asks, who is taller, Yao Ming or uh, Liu Xiang is another athlete, and then um, popular in China. And, uh, and then the uh, system may return, yeah, who, who, he is, uh, who is taller and uh, uh, what's the height of the other uh, athlete. And, uh, and uh, even f for this very simple example, it would be very difficult to formalize this uh, second round of uh, dialogue as a kind of uh, matching or retrieval uh, problem. Because in this uh, second round of uh, dialogue, uh, first, inference is involved, right? And <laughs> you need to compare, the system needs to compare the heights of two people, right? And also, the system needs to uh, keep, uh, keep track the conversation so far and who, who, who is, uh, what's the height of the previous uh, person, etc. right? So it, it's not a simple, you know, uh, matching or retrieval problem. So uh, doing our uh, human mental processing maybe uh, is a very complicated task and multiple modules are involved and also um, multiple types of uh, pro information processing uh, get involved in this whole process. Even it's a very simple example, you can see that it's not clear at least that deep learning can also solve this problem and contribute. And it involves, you know, inference, decision, etc. Yeah, so it's still not <coughs> clear at least. Deep learning may not help uh, in this challenging problem. And uh, uh, yeah, so I have explained this. So maybe for multi-turn dialogue, deep learning would not be enough, at least. And uh, another challenge for deep learning uh, in natural language processing is uh, challenge in the tail. Uh, so uh, as you know, uh, natural language uh, data usually follows uh, the power law distribution. Uh, that means there is always a, always a long tail. So this just one example. So for example, if you uh, collect the uh, news articles uh, in Xinhua News uh, Agency and, uh, and through the year, uh, you, you can get uh, more news articles. 
And uh, once you have more uh, data articles uh, in the corpus, then you can observe that the number of uh, words, uh, uh, unique words, or the size of vocabulary increases. Uh, it's not a linear, but almost sublinear, but you can, this is a very uh, typical trend. When you have more data in natural language, you all usually always get more uh, unique vocabularies, like unique names, etc., uh, new terminologies, etc. And uh, it's, it's, it, that means uh, it's a, a kind of never-ending story, right? You always have new vocabularies. And uh, so, so if you just train the model uh, using statistical approach, uh, this is not only for deep learning, this is also true for deep learning. Um, so you always, have, you always have a lot of uh, long tail words and real words, right? How to tr train the model uh, with regard to the uh, real words, right? Is, is, is a uh, big challenge um, because it's, if you just take the data to train that part of the model and then uh, the, the model is always not well trained, right? It can always not cover the long tail and the number of real words is also quite large. It's not so small, right? So this is uh, another issue, at least not solved uh, by deep learning uh, in natural language processing. And uh, finally, yeah, this is final uh, problem with deep learning. Uh, and uh, we have observed many interesting uh, phenomena uh, for uh, uh, deep learning. Uh, recently, there is also a very interesting paper from Google about generalization ability of deep learning. Uh, I don't know whether you have uh, heard about this work. And uh, uh, this is also uh, interesting and also <coughs> Uh, in accordance with our, our own observations. We, 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 we have observed a similar uh, phenomena in our own work for natural language processing using deep learning. Uh, so so for, for, for first, let's think about uh, generalization ability of deep learning. Yeah, so this is about generalization ability of deep learning. Um, so generalization is a very key aspect of machine learning. Otherwise, if uh, an algorithm cannot generalize that means it does not work, right? Generalization ability is fundamentally important for any machine learning algorithm. Um, but usually, this is one interesting phenomenon. Uh, when you train a, a deep neural network uh, in practice, usually we don't observe overfitting. Uh, that means the generalization works quite well. So the model is huge. Usually, you have a huge amount of data to train the model. And when you look at the uh, training error, and also the test error. You see the training error and the test error are similar. Yeah, not maybe exactly the same, but are similar. That means they are usually all small, and uh, there is very good generalization. There is no overfitting. And th this is uh, one observation uh, in, in practice. And another interesting thing is neural networks can memorize training instances, as we have seen uh, in our uh, demo, right? So for the uh, dialogue example, so the model can memorize training instances. Yeah, so, so this is also observed in computer vision. Yeah, when, when, once you have some instances input into the uh, 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 training data, and then the, the training instances can be memorized by the model. And uh, so this is from Google's work, uh, which is very interesting and a very interesting idea. And uh, so the basic idea is this. They, they just inject some noise into training data uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the training phase. In an extre extreme case, they randomize everything in the training data. So that means the uh, training data is completely noise uh, for, for training. But still, the neural network can memorize the noises. That, and, and that means in this case, uh, in, in the extreme case, uh, the training error is zero because it can memorize everything. Even the, it's, all the noise is injected into the training data. The, the model can uh, memorize, can remember the, 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 the examples, right? The training error is, is, is zero. But the test uh, error is huge because there is no relation uh, between the, the, the uh, input and output uh, uh, in, in the training data. The learned model is 
really random, right? But when it, the model is applied to a prediction in test, then it cannot work. And, uh, but th this phenomenon is also observed in our own uh, experiments uh, for natural language. So this is very um, surprising, or in some sense, very interesting, uh, because that means um, the previous theory about generalization ability is broken here. They, they cannot explain the phenomena here. Because, um, yeah, so one, one important uh, thing for uh, neural network learning is that uh, the number of parameters is usually very large. It's larger than the number of training instances. That's also the case in our case. We have 100 million parameters to train, but we don't have so many instances in our training data, right? That's one of the reasons we can imagine that the uh, neural network can uh, memorize the training instances. Uh, however, it's not clear how to interpret uh, the behavior when you inject noises uh, into the, uh, the training data. The, the uh, uh, discrepancy between the uh, training error and test error when you have uh, some noises in the training data. So there are many open problems here and it's still not clear how to uh, explain this. All the existing generalization theory, if you are familiar with machine learning theory, um, the machine learning theory based on VC dimension, rat macro average, uh, etc., they cannot e e explain the, the phenomena here. Yeah. So in, in some sense, all the existing theories are broken. So, so yeah, so, so then we have this kind of question. Uh, what would be the generalization theory for, much, for deep learning? When the, the model is complicated enough, right? And uh, there is no theory about this. And to me, this is really a, a math problem because for machine learning, uh, eventually you want to learn, you want to learn a function, right? It's a function approximation problem. You want to approximate a function with data. But when the function is very, very complicated, you don't have so much data to uh, approximate the function. Uh, and then, um, then we have observed many <laughs> interesting and strange phenomena. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when the model, the function, is a kind of nonlinear um, function, uh, like neural network we have, right? And uh, so what's that? And uh, I really hope the people in the audience who get interested in this kind of problem to really address and help us to solve the problem, right? So, so to me, I would <laughs> say that deep learning really uh, creates a new crisis for machine learning because we don't have theory. And uh, on, on one hand, we have many successful application stories to show that deep learning can really do a very good job in practice. On the other hand, we really don't have any theory to explain why, you know. And uh, th this kind of big gap really needs help from mathematicians <laughs> to, to, to solve. Yeah, that's my talk, and uh, thank you. Are there questions? Uh, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I just have a question about how you input language. So, do you, so if I have a two words, say, do I input it as two separate uh, unit vectors with zeros everywhere and just one at one place? Uh, usually we don't do that. We, we need to compress, otherwise there's so many parameters because we have a lot of uh, words, right, in practice. And so there is a technique called a uh, word to vec. Uh, that's an algorithm uh, to try to compress. Uh, so, so usually the, what we have mentioned is one method. We don't use it in practice, which, which, is, which is called one hot vector. Mm -hmm. One is zero, the other is uh, one, is one, the other is zero. Uh, and we try to, in, in, prin uh, in theory, in principle, c try to compress with co-occurrence information uh, with a uh, lower dimensional vector, but um, more dense. So one hot vector is very sparse, right? Uh, with denser, uh, low dimensional vector to represent each individual word as a starting point. Uh, we have several techniques developed for, uh, not the, the community has several techniques developed for, for doing that. And another thing, um, do people you ever try to use uh, letters instead of words as the... Yeah, yes, 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 yes. That's also uh, 
a very interesting and uh, uh, approach and quite powerful. For, for example, for translation uh, among European languages, mm -hmm. it works quite well. Or, uh, or a, a string of, of letters, uh, we call it subword. Also, yeah, it also works. Yeah. Good question. Good question. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, so you say most of your 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 points. Uh, that is just not impressive, but I mean, at no point actually the system is understanding what it's suggesting. I mean, so when you have this dialogue thing, uh, you are producing the right answer, which looks to human reasonable, but the system doesn't understand what the system is saying, right? Right. Right. It has no clue actually. I mean, there is no interpretation behind. No. You're just going and find on your or what you did training something that is similar. Right. Right. That's the same thing on translation. I mean, the, yes, there is yes. no reasoning behind. Right. It's right. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. No reasoning. So right. I think for all the tasks where we don't need the reasoning, uh, putting more and more data uh, right. will do will most likely will do better. Right. And deep learning methods will be the right answer. But if you go to the uh, question where you have this multitask dialing, right. then you need reasoning. You need right, to be able right, to right, understand right. the question. Yeah. So, do you think in the future that we will not we will not read regionally anymore at all for uh, all the tasks? Because you can imagine maybe if you have enough data, so you don't need to reason anymore. Mm, no, no, no. I'm not so extreme. So I, 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 I kind of uh, agree with you. Uh, you talked. There is another approach, right? So I, 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 I think that yeah, discriminative and generative. Yeah, I, I think reasoning is very important. Yeah, not you know just to employ the brute force um, approach to use data to do that. There is clearly a limitation. Maybe yeah. if you have enough data, we don't need to understand it anymore. We just uh, <laughs> if you have enough. But for shallow for shallow problems, yeah. so if you it's a multitask uh, dialogue um, or multi turn dialogue, mm -hmm. it would be more complicated, right? You don't have. Enough data. So data is observation, right? You just look at the, uh, the behaviors of a person. You cannot model his thinking, right? Something like that. But for example, you can imagine using approach from li linguistics to generate sentences, which make sense. Right. And then having the answers, and then keep feeding them to your training, to your network. But for simple tasks, it would be possible. Yeah, translation is a simple task, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, but for multi-turn dialogue, I doubt it's not right. And uh, even for single-turn generative approach to dialogue, there is limitation, right? We, uh, we can only achieve 76% of accuracy. Yeah, right, right. B because you only observe. You don't have any understanding, inference, etc. So there is clear uh, limitation. Yeah, I don't personally believe, yeah, I'm interested in how far we can go, but I, I don't think we can, uh, with this kind of simple data-driven approach, to achieve human you know, capability of uh, using language. And do you think that the le deep learning as it is, I mean, human intelligence, we, I think we do reasoning, right? I, I yes, mean, I, yeah, I'm yeah, not sure. so sure, but I think we do reasoning. I mean, it's, uh, sure. we are we're a rule-based rule system. Humans are rule-based system. I mean, we learn things and we apply rules. This is a non-rule-based system. I mean, so we have no clue what is happening. Right, right. Well, I would say that we take a kind of hybrid approach. For some, we have some patterns, right? Yeah, we memorize something. For that part, that can be maybe learned or acquired by deep learning. But we also have reasoning, etc., capability uh, for t long tail phenomena, right? <laughs> we use reasoning capability. Yeah, otherwise we cannot handle, right? We don't have difficulty of uh, dealing with tail, but you know, for machine, if you take data-driven approach, there's always a limitation there. Yeah. Other questions? So, yeah, uh, Ernie? I have some question about um, how well is, uh, how can you judge that uh, algorithm output from another algorithm? For example, you have some actions like inference, um, memory, how, how can you say uh, one inference answer is better than another inference answer, or some one memory. How how can you quantize a good memory? You, you know, these things. Uh, sometimes you have objective uh, right. magic. Some, right. Sometimes you have subjective magic. Right. How how can you judge it? The uh, outcome of algorithm is good or is usually we take a, a task driven <coughs> approach. Right. If the task is well defined, 
if you want to accomplish something with a robot, you communicate with the robot, if the robot can quickly understand your point and accomplish the task, then we say, yeah, the robot is doing a very good job. So, yeah, yeah, so in all the problems, usually we try to derive material uh, criteria to uh, do evaluation, etc., right, and based on the task, yeah. So otherwise it's difficult, yeah. Yeah, so maybe I have one, two general questions. If uh -huh. One is around, uh, you were saying about um, the fact that you need to label and stuff. And, and this goes back to the question of unsupervised learning. Right. What do you think about the future of unsupervised learning and applications for communication? Telecommunication, okay. Because one of the big problems that we have here is that you need to, to label the data. Right, you know right, what I mean? right, right. And, 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 and uh, okay, there are some companies who are, who are very, uh, I mean, taking advantage of the, of the fact that Facebook and others, where people label things just because they're on the web and they do it right, for right. free. And the question is that if we can't label data, what, what do we do? Yeah, so yes, I, I, I agree that as for what's learning, yeah, is a very important topic from now, yeah. Do you yeah. think that's the future or? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I yeah. agree. Yeah, and once we have problems in supervised learning addressed or uh, quite well, right? Yeah, we need put more effort in research on unsupervised learning. Yeah, I agree. And my second question is is one of crit criticism of the, of the black box approach. You're right. Is the fact that we don't know what's happening. Basically, you were saying, okay. Right. You know, one of the problem with the, with, the, with deep learning is that it right. looks like a black box. But the other advantage of at least when I hear people about using AI, is that whenever they don't understand anything, uh -huh. they like it because it's a black box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because then it's, we, we don't know how to put our hands in it, we don't understand anything, and they say it's better to model everything as a black box and to train the box. So, right. so, so my feeling is that the black box approach, at least as far as I see people going in, is whenever they can't model things, they consider it as a very good asset to have a black box. Yeah, in some sense, yeah. But sometimes you want to have some understanding, right? The yeah. mechanism, at least the mechanism. Uh, you don't need, maybe need to understand the details, but at least some level understanding is necessary. That's why I think um, we, we need to put more effort in research on understanding of the mechanism in deep learning. Otherwise, we all have problems. It's, it's, it's a science, right? We need to understand the details to some extent. Yeah, I'm totally, I agree with you. The only thing I see yeah. is that the approach of the AI people is that because we cannot understand, it's better to model as a black box and we're not going to make any effort to understand. Uh, the, the, that's the feeling approach I see people. That's Whenever some people, right? AI, yeah. It's too hard to, to understand the whole box. Right. So I'm just going to consider it as a black box and I go for it. It will become a kind of philosophical problem, right? It's difficult to argue and uh, so if you take the view from the behavior uh, point, point, right, and uh, then it's, it's okay, you just model the behavior, right? You don't care about the uh, inside, and that's black box approach. But for building the goal of building AI, I, I think it's necessary to understand somewhat the you know, inside, and uh, that's why you know, behavior approach is not enough, I, I, I think. No, I fully agree with you. Yeah. I'm trying to find a mix of, of people trying to mix, uh, like, like you were saying, the prior, and yeah. the, the human aspect, the, the understanding, yeah. with yeah. AI, and how you can match both will, will be a good thing. I yeah. think we're lacking how to incorporate in a mathematics. Right, 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 uh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to, AI, this is my view, yeah. So, yeah, 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 I, I agree. There are three approaches to AI, maybe. One is you just uh, um, behavior, right? look at the behavior, data-driven approach, right? It's the mo most successful approach for now, right? Another is you look at the mechanism, human brain, try to understand the mechanism and build a model, right? Mm -hmm. And to mimic human brain's mechanism, right? That's another uh, ex extreme, right? Uh, it's an approach. It does not work so well because we don't understand the human brain very well now. <laughs> at least for now, maybe it takes hundreds of years, right? Yeah. Another approach would be a kind of um, knowledge-based, because we, we know, we have knowledge, we know, we, 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 we can write down everything, right? We know that's the traditional AI approach, symbolic approach, or knowledge-based yeah. uh, approach. Uh, it, it didn't work well, right? The failure of traditional AI was because <laughs> people believe that everything could be 
uh, realized with the knowledge in incorporated into the system, right? R rules defined by humans, by experts, etc. It didn't work well, right? Maybe a kind of hybrid in the future is, at, at least in the coming years, would work quite well. That is the, the main part, the main framework is still data driven, but we get inspiration from human brains. That's what we are using deep learning, right? On the other hand, we also take human knowledge, we incorporate human knowledge into the model, and uh, a kind of good mix of the three approaches, right? But with data driven as the main, because that's the only approach to me, we can mathematically, <laughs> mathematically define the models very elegantly, right? With the knowledge based approach, is still, if you only look at knowledge, it's, but your approach is still a statistical approach with some knowledge or prior incorporated, right? So, so the framework is still statistics, mathematics, right? For the other two approaches, human brain, brain approach or the knowledge, purely knowledge based approach, is still not clear, maybe possible in the future to, to define kind of mathematical model to solve the, the problems, right? That's why we, we have to uh, take a kind of hybrid approach for AI uh, in the coming years. That's my personal view.